Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord one more time. You know, it's always good to share in the word of God. You know, the word is life. Jesus said the word that these words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And, you know, it's always good to share in the word, you know, with us. You know, I'm just sitting in for Bishop Daly. And, uh, you know, I just want to share what is in my spirit, what is on my heart with us. Uh, we might not be through tonight, uh, but chances are next week uh, we might be able to um, continue. Right, so before we even read the scriptures, you know, I just want us to read a word of prayer and then um, we get into the word. Let me just, before we pray, just greet each and every one that is tuning in. I greet you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. You know, at his name, the Bible says, every knee will have to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So whether you are streaming from Jamaica, whether you are streaming from overseas, this evening, tonight, I greet you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us pray together. Father, we come to you tonight and we want to give you thanks for your love. We want to give you thanks for your mercy, for your blessings upon us. We thank you, God, for yet again another moment, Lord, in which we can share in your word. We want to thank you, God, that you have a word for your people. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will help us to take these words, not just to take them, Lord Jesus, but to apply them to our lives that we might become better individuals. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will just touch this vessel tonight and that you will just use it to accomplish what you will. I am an empty vessel, Lord Jesus, but God, fill my mouth tonight and accomplish what you will. Let as your words go forth, that is accomplish your perfect will as we give you thanks tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I would like us to turn in our Bibles, if you have your Bibles at home, yes, turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Right? And we'll be doing something that is familiar to each and every one of us, but is where my heart is. I believe that in this time, as people of God, we are to be more concerned about living. So anything that will help us to live the way Christ wants us to live, then that is important. The, 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 the rich young ruler, Jesus said to him, thou lackest one thing. And this which young ruler went away with his face hanging down because that one thing that he should have done was to sell his possession and give to the poor. But the Bible said that he had great possessions. And, uh, you know, he ended up choosing the possession rather than giving up that one thing. And tonight... I don't know what is that one thing, um, but I feel, I just feel in my spirit that, you know, we should, you know, just focus on living for Christ. Uh, I, I, probably it's what is happening around us. We have never seen a time like this, but I believe that, you know, our focus should be, yes, we want to know the word of God because it is the word of God that is going to help us to live. But, you know, we want to, you know, just focus on living, you know, practically, and, and, you know, I want to get in some things with us so that we understand where I'm coming from. So turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, very familiar passage of scripture, um, 10 through to 13. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And if we have our Bibles with us tonight, I want us to just underline the words stand 
and wild. Put on the old armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Very important because if we are going to live how Christ wants us to live, we have got to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Amen. You know, the Bible says, the, the Bible says in Matthew 4, verses 4, right, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You know, as we listen to Bishop, you know, get into living by the word over the past couple of weeks, you know, I, I can't help but you know, but just think, I can't help but just have it in my spirit how, you know, important it is to live, you know, by the word of God. And we are living in challenging times. But I believe, come at the hour, come at the man. And I believe that God has given us a wise leader. And for such a time as this, and I implore us, you know, to continue to pray for our leaders, our bishops and our leaders in general, you know, that, you know, God will continue to lead them, direct them, that God will continue to keep them and, you know, give them wisdom. But come at the hour, come at the man, and I believe that, you know, we have a man after God's own heart, you know, that is uh, leading us in this time, in these challenges time. God have a man for the hour, and that is our bishop, Rafi Daly. I just want to just lift my hat to him, you know, because, you know, he's doing a good work. I believe that we are living in a time where as children of the living God, and as we travel along this Christian journey, this Christian pathway that we have begun, we have answered the call of God, we have repented of our sins, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and God has seen it fit to fill us with the Holy Ghost. On this Christian pathway that we are on, this Christian journey, we are at a juncture where if we say that we love God, we are going to have to prove it. Gone are the days when we see that we love God, our folks say, yes, man, we love God. I may serve him, I'm going to church, and all of that. Well, we are living in a time right now that is so challenging. If we say that we love God, we are going to have to prove it. In this time that we are living in, it is not enough to say that we love Jesus. It is not enough to say that I love Jesus. The way we walk is going to have to say I love Jesus. The way we talk is going to have to say that I love Jesus. Our actions are going to have to say that you know we love Jesus even when it pertains to our will. Lord, it's not my will, but thine will be done. So in every aspect of our life, if we say that we love Jesus, every aspect of our life, we are in that time, in that period, where every aspect of our life, we'll have to know, say, Jesus, I love you. It was Jesus that said in John 14, 15. I think we have that scripture. St. John 14, 15. So we have got to be mindful that if we love the Lord, our actions, our speech, everything in this time is going to have to say that we love Jesus. 
you might think that he can can't see me, bishop can't see me, so I can do this or I can do that. But the time right now is saying that you have to make sure that your life is right with God. So Jesus said it in St. John 14, verses 15. And I want us to, to understand this, right? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want us to understand that the commandments are written in the words of God. Yes, the, 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 the Bible says that the Lord will know. Fill us with his spirit. And when he fills us with his spirit, the spirit will guide us into all truth. But at the same time, we have got to recognize that the spirit works with what is on the inside. So if we are not acquainted, if we are not in the word of God, we are going to find out that though the spirit will trouble your conscience, there won't be any knowledge to say, my conscience is saying the right thing. Because there is not the word of God that is embedded in us. You know, I'm glad that we are in a Bible reading time, a Bible reading session where we spend the time to read the word of God at 9 p.m. Everything that you're doing, you know, and I'm glad all, every member of the family does, does rally around. You know, sometimes you might find yourself doing something and they say, Daddy, it's Bible reading time. Mommy, it's Bible reading time. And sometimes, you know, I have to say, Son, it's Bible reading time. But it's just a good thing, you know, that we read the word of God together. I am looking for it. I don't want this thing to stop. And I, and I think I'm going to whisper it in Bishop's ear. Bishop, you know, you see, when we finish the Psalms, probably we need to read the Proverbs together. And then probably when we finish the Proverbs, we probably think on the book of Ephesians and, 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 and you know, we just read through the books. And we just keep this thing going as a part, you know, of our church doing. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Right? If you are struggling to read the word, I, I tell you, you know, you need companion, you need somebody to say, yes, you know, when we read together. You, 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 you get the sense that it's not just you alone, it's not just your household alone, but it's a, 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 a wide spread of people, not just locally, but internationally. You know, I pray that we will continue the reading. And I'm also glad that Bishop is calling on some of these young people to exhort or to just say what they learn about the scripture. And, and that is good. This keep them, this keep, I tell you, you know, come at the hour, come at the man. This keep the young people on their, on their toes. And I believe that, you know, sometime, you know, probably we'll call on some of the other folks, some of the middle aged folks, to see what, you know, they are retaining from the scriptures that, you know, they are reading. It is extremely important. We thought, so, so while we're reading, it is good. But the application is important. The meditation and the application is important. We have to meditate upon the word of God. And, and because it is the word of God now that will help us. Those words that you underline in your Bible stand against the wiles of the adversary. It's when you read the word, meditate upon it, have it in your spirit that you are going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the topic that we really want to look at tonight is identifying and overcoming the wiles of the adversary. Identifying and overcoming the wiles of the adversary. Some of the things that we want to look at you know, as follows, the apostle said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, we want to clearly define what the, what, what the apostle meant when he said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Right? Um, 
And why did he say it? Why did the, adver did, did the apostle use that term? The passage also said in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It is easy to read Ephesians 6.12 and say that yes, we are in a spiritual warfare. Yes, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is easy to read that. But how many of us know the opponent that we are up against. Very important. Because if you are going to live a victorious Christian life, you have got to know your enemies. Right? You have got to know who you are up against. The fact is that this adversary wants to destroy your soul. He wants to destroy my soul. And he will not spare any measure to destroy us. It therefore means that we have to know who the adversary is. In knowing who the adversary is, you will know his schemes, you will know his devices that he'll try to use against you as an individual. Right? It is therefore important for us to understand. Also, in understanding who the adversary is, it is important for us to understand who we are. And the sister said it so eloquently on Sunday. We need to understand who we are and whose we are. If you don't know your identity and whose you are, <laughs> you will have no sense of direction. You will live below your privilege. You will live a life that is defeated. So if knowing our enemy, we are going to have to first know ourselves. These are some of the things that we want to look at. So just giving you a, a, a little overview of, you know. And so we are to know also. So point two, we have to know our enemy that we are up against. Before engaging in any battle, it is wise, to, uh, wise and it is always important to know our enemy, right? And what he is capable of. If you don't know your enemy, then you cannot possibly know how to begin to fight your enemy. So sometimes we come to church and we think going through the enemy's camp to take back what he stole from us. Right? And under church, under the tent, we have this anointing and we sing the song and we run the aisles and we say, yes, we're going to the enemy's camp. But we sing the song, but we can't go to the enemy's camp. We dare not set foot in the enemy's camp. Because we don't even know who the enemy is. We don't even know who is it that we are up against. But we know from reading the scripture that there is an enemy of our soul. So it's important then that we get to know this enemy. So we, we are going to take a time, some time and we are going to look at this enemy. Look at who the enemy is. Right? So if you don't know the enemy, then you cannot possibly know how to begin to fight your enemy. You should not run in any battle blindly around the field to fight a battle not knowing what the conditions are or whether you are fighting so a soldier on an open field or whether you're in a guerrilla type warfare. You know, it is always wise to know as much as possible about your enemy. And the commander of the enemy army, so as to prepare properly for fighting. Knowing nothing about your enemy means not defeating your enemy. If you know nothing, so I'm reading a quote here now from Santos. Um, from the book, The Art of War. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not to fear the result of a hundred battles. So it's very important that we know ourselves and that we know the enemy that we are up against. So if you know your enemy and know yourself, 
you need not to fear the result of a hundred battles. So, but if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, <laughs> you will lose every battle. So it is important then if we are going to be triumphant in our Christian work that we know who we are, we know whose we are, and that we know the enemy that we are up against. And we are going to spend some time to look at the enemy. When we look in the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers chapter 13, it's a bit to read, but we can read some of it. Numbers chapter 13, 1 to 3, and then 17 to 33, and then 14 verses 8. This is Numbers, right? It was God that instructed Moses to send spies into the land. Because God, he understands everything. He knew that it was not good to send the Israelites into battle blindly. And so he said, get some men and send them into battle. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, so we're reading, we reading the book now. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Every tribe of their fathers shall he send a man, everyone a ruler among them. Uh, so, so I want to just, we're doing the introduction, you know, but, but let me just take my time here. So we can paint a picture now. So the Lord saw the importance of sending spies into the land to spy out the land before the army of Israel went into the land. We're clear on that. But look at the bottom part of the scripture. It says, everyone a ruler among them. All these men that went to spy out the land were leaders. So I want us to make note of that, you know. All these men that went to spy out the land were leaders. Let us read the next chapter, the next scripture. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All these men were heads of the children. You see the emphasis the Bible put in on, put in on the head. All these men, because it tell you in the previous scripture, you know, that these men were head of their household. And it mentioned it two times in that scripture. And it come back now to verse 3 and it said, And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All these men were heads of the children. So in two scriptures, three times the Bible is saying that these men were leaders. Right? So let me just say this. It is important then that as a church we continuously pray for our leaders. We hear it often and it comes like a cliche. But as often as possible, we need to pray for our leaders, especially in these times. Today, yes, we have numbers and say that we can have a certain amount under the 10. But tomorrow, but tomorrow, it can be a different saying, something different. And then probably we have to go back to what we were before. But it takes a leader. Go back to my opening statement. Commit the hour. Commit the man. Amen. So it's important then that we pray for our leaders. 
that God will direct them, that, 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 that they will follow the leading of the Lord. And it's extremely important that they will abide in the will of the Lord. Not just for themselves, but for the decision that they make for the entire church. It's very important. And as we go down, we're going to see how important it is. Right. So, so we say that number. So, so we look, jump down now to verse 17. It's going to be a little bit of reading, but jump down now to verse 17. And we're going to go from 17 through to 33. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein. So listen now, you know, this is what he's saying. Look at the land. Look at the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, whether they be few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be. So everything, this, everything that he is saying that you should look at, you know, will now tell him how he is to prepare to go into the land and fight against the enemy so that they can take the land. So God instructed him to instruct them by means of strategizing so that he could find out what is it. God knew, you know, God could have said to them, look here, this is how you're going to fight the battle. This is all. But God wanted them to go down there and look and come back with a report. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities there be that they dwell in, whether it in tents or in strongholds. Strongholds mean you have fenced cities. Right? And tents, you cannot run out of tent and take out anybody and, and destroy somebody. But fortified city, strong city, and, and it means that, you know, the city was fortified. And what the land is, oh, we read that already, right? And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring up the fruit of the land. No, the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. The Bible makes sure point that out to us, you know. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamat. And they ascend by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheheshai, and Talmai, the children of Enoch, were. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they, and they ascend unto the brook of Eshkol cut down from thence a branch with a cluster of grapes. While I prepare, I'll, I'll, I'll look at this. And they went and they cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. I have never seen a grape bunch yet that two men have to carry. Probably that might happen somewhere else, but not in Jamaica. And, and I travel now and then, and they have some nice big grapes, but I've never seen a bunch of grapes that two men have to carry. But the Bible says, and, and I laugh as I prepare myself, the men, they were saying, yes, you know, the land fat. And after seeing all the land fruitful, they were still doubting. 
The place was called the Brook of Eshkol because the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We come unto the land whither thou sentest us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey because the evidence is there. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Ana there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land. And the Etites. All right, so we can stop here. But like we were saying, it was God that instructed. It was God that instructed the land. Moses to spy out the land. Because he wanted them to see what they were up against. And it's a good thing when we have an enemy to know what the enemy is about so that we can get to strategize, so that we can get to plan and, and do you know, what it is that God would have us to do. Because though the Lord wants the best for us, and though the, the Holy Ghost in us will convict us and will direct us and will lead us and say, look here, don't go there, or don't go there, and look, turn. The Holy Ghost will tell us that. God is not going to come down and live for any one of us. We have to do that. We have to, we will make the decisions. If the Holy Ghost even prompts us, it's still we going to make the decision. It's just that we have to be willing to submit to the Holy Ghost to make the decision that the Holy Ghost is prompting us to make. But God is not going to come down and live for, every, for any one of us. So we sent them to spy out the land. And he sent all the leaders, and they came back. They came back with two bunch, two bunches of grape that I have never seen. They also failed to recognize, and this is why it's important now that we have to look at who we are and whose we are. They failed to recognize whose they were. Only two were convinced. And we'll go back to the scripture. That we might be able to stand against the wiles of the adversary. But he described the scripture before that. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might or in his mighty power. But then... Then they, these men, when they saw these giants in the land, they weren't even thinking about, you see why it is important that when you look at certain scriptures, you start to look at some other scriptures to, to get a full understanding of what, you know, the apostle was saying. Because the apostle knew what he's talking about, you know. And... These men, they went in the land and spy out. And they see the grapes. And it's the same people. You know why that, you know why God brought them into the wilderness? Because they said it was better that they had died in the wilderness. I don't want us to think that God is a wicked God, you know. That God does bring them in the wilderness. And kill off everybody over a certain age. Leave only Caleb and Joshua. No. The people asked for it. They said, look here. It's 
prefer for them to leave with back in Egypt. I prefer we die in the wilderness. The people went as far as to try to choose another leader to, to, to take them back to Egypt. God said, all right, man. Let me show you what I'm going to do now. Because your cry is that you dwell in the wilderness. I am going to keep you in the wilderness. And you're not going to make it out of the wilderness. Because it's your words that says it's prefer you die in the wilderness. So we want to look a little bit at the enemy and look at the strategies and some of the things that he used you know, to deceive us. And we want to be as practical as possible. I, I, while we come in from the word, we want to be as practical as possible so that we can see and, and, and we, are, we, we are able to identify from the situations around us, our situation that we ourselves might be involved in. How the adversary works and the things that he would do to deceive us, the things that he will do to trip us up the things that he will do to keep us bound. Keep our, our feet in shackles. Keep our minds in shackles. Hallelujah. And we want to look a little bit at this and, and see how the adversary works. Right? And then, we know about the armor already. But as we go through, we might uh, go through and talk about the, 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 the wiles and some of the devices of the adversary. We will, you know, incorporate how it is that we should, you know, have on the breastplate of righteousness and, and, and the sword of the spirit. And it, because we go through the word of God, so we know a little bit. But I really want to focus. This is where I feel led to go. Focus on the thing practically so that we can see certain things how the adversary really, really try to trick us and try to, you, you know, get us, especially in this time. Amen. Um, so we read from Ephesians chapter 6. In this chapter, the apostles started out by exhorting, the, the, the entire Ephesians 6, now it started out by exhorting the folks to relative duties, which he started from the previous chapter, chapter 5. He particularly insisted on the duties of children and parents and of servants and masters. That is from verses 1 through to verse 9. Secondly, he exhorts and directs Christians, right, how to behave themselves in the spiritual warfare with the enemies of their soul. So like I've been saying that we have an enemy of our soul, but how many of us are really aware that we have an enemy of our soul? How many of us are aware of his devices, aware of the things that he's trying to do, even right now, to destroy your soul, right? Um, when we say we have an enemy, I'm not being fictitious because Yes, we talk about an enemy, and we can't see the enemy, but we also talk about a God, that we, but we can't see that God. But we know that that God is alive. Based on our experience with the Holy Ghost, we know that that God is real. And if that God is real, you can't see him. The enemy is also real. It's not a fictitious enemy. Therefore, this is a real enemy that has set out to destroy our souls and his intent towards us is evil continually. The Bible says in St. John 10, verses 10,
The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Christ said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. 1 Peter 5, verses 8, talking about the enemy, you know. Because though Christ talks about the thief, the only person that is trying to compete with Christ is Satan. So really what Christ was doing here in this passage, St. John 10, verses 10, he said, look here, this is what the enemy come. The enemy don't mean the flock any good. The enemy wants to feel that the flock is on, and he will destroy the field. And then when he get the flock, the flock don't have anything to eat, so automatically the flock is destroyed. But Jesus is saying now that I come, that you might have life, and that you might have life more abundantly. So everything that we want. So, so, so Christ is really telling us something here about the enemy, right? In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 also, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So if you think that it is a fictitious enemy, Christ himself spoke about it, right? The apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5 verses 8, spoke about it, that we are supposed to be vigilant. It's not a fictitious enemy. We have a real, real enemy that is trying to destroy. Have you ever seen somebody that was in church? Oh, God. Somebody that was in church serving God. The adversary get a hold on them. Pull them out. And wreck them. So you might think that when we say adversary is a fictitious adversary. But it's not a fictitious adversary. If somebody that has experienced the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And the Satan is able to pull them out and mash them up. Oh, Jesus. It is not a fictitious enemy. Mm. Real, real enemy that we're dealing with. So I want us to know that. So, they, so we are now saying that the apostle was now exhorting and directing Christians how to behave themselves in spiritual warfare with the enemies of their souls. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I want to read some different rendering for us, for us to get an understand, understanding of. So the King James Version says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Want to look at the NIV. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then we want to look at the English Standard Version. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And finally, you want to look at the New English translation. Right? It says, finally, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. The New English translation, finally, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. 
So what does it mean to be strong in the Lord or to be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might or in his mighty power? The words strengthen and his derivatives are used some 360 times in the Bible, applying to both natural and supernatural strength. The Greek word that is used here is ketiai, and it means power, strength, or might. In the Bible, Strength is often linked to God's power. Believers are to be strong, and this is a scripture that we read, and it is what we are looking at now. Believers are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. According to the Bible, what strength we have is not of our own. It ultimately comes from God. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength, but let the one who boasts about this, that they have the understanding to know that I am the Lord. And this is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. So what God was saying through the prophet, that if the person boasts themselves, let them understand that I am the Lord. So what God is saying that any strength a man think that he has, the strength comes from me, or the strength comes from God. So any strength that we find ourselves with, not of ourselves, it is of God. The word that is translated here, be strong, that is from the same Ephesians 9, um, 6, 10. The word translated here, be strong, actually means to be strengthened as rendered as render in the last scripture that we have read. Um, the New English translation which said, finally be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Here strengthened refers to a person being weak, it is not referring to a person being weak and then receive strength. So you might have the flu and feel weak and then you get better and feel strong. Here strength is not saying it's, a, a, it's within a person. What it is saying is that this strength that the individual receives comes from God. So this strength is not your own. It is not something that you muster up within. You know that sometimes you watch a movie and the guys just decide that, look here, yes, we can do it. And everybody just muster up and, you know, fish and the star is the star. But or sometimes we, we, we might be playing a game and I am very competitive when I'm playing basketball. And sometimes the game is so tight and you just must have something. I remember we were playing basketball and the side of win 19-2. And we came back and win it. And we were going 21. And we came back and win it. I hit the last shot, the last shot from almost the half line. But you just must have up something from the inside. This strength that the Bible is talking about here is not that, that will or that strength that we must start up from the inside and win that basketball game. No. It is talking about a supernatural force. And this is important because we are in a spiritual battle. And you cannot use natural strength to fight a spiritual battle. Hence, the apostle was saying that we are to be strong in the Lord are to be strengthened by the Lord in his mighty power. So as the apostle encouraged the believers, one of the things he reminded them of was that as Christians, a life of 
participation in a spiritual battle is a must. In other words, from you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, you are a part of a spiritual battle. So Paul in his teaching, let the, 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 the church know, the scripture is letting us know as Christians that once we are called by the name of Jesus, we are involved in a spiritual battle. From his own experience, the apostle knew the opposition is real. And I don't even have to go as far as the apostle. I am going to tell you that the opposition is real. And the warfare is intense. I want that to soak a little bit. The opposition that we face is real. And the warfare is intense. Tonight, the opposition is real. Let me say it one more time. And the warfare is intense. If as Christians we think that we can hide from the battle, we are making a sad mistake. If you think that, yes, I can be a part of the battle, but the heart of the battle, the most focal point, is on the other side. And as much as possible I, am possible, I am going to avoid the other side. You're making a sad mistake. I am going to tell you that the adversary will take the heart of the battle at your doorstep. Mm. So if you think that you can be a soldier in the Lord's army, and say, let the leaders and those who really, really, really and truly are fanatics in the church stay in the hottest part of the battle. I will stay on this side and I will pray for them. The adversary, this same adversary, is going to take the battle at your doorstep. As a matter of fact, as I speak, Speak right now as I speak tonight. There might be folks that are streaming and the battle is at your doorstep right now. How is it that you are dealing with it? So we are saying that the adversary will take the battle at your doorstep. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Since the believers are engaged in an ongoing spiritual battle the with the powers of darkness, we cannot endure except we have the power of God. And as we look at the enemy, we are going to realize a whole lot of things about us in comparison to the enemy, which means we have to then rely on the strength of the Lord if we are going to be, live a victorious life. Like I said, make no mistake about it. The devil will take the battle at your doorstep. The heart of the battle might just be where you are. But to overcome, we have got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Because it is vital towards living a Christian life. So the first important thing that we need to know about be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might is that to be strong in the Lord is not talking about 
strength. As believers, we don't possess the strength, nor can we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Rather, we must be empowered and we must be strengthened, as the Greek voice indicates. The next thing we need to understand, what it means to be strong in the Lord, is the term in the Lord. The apostle could have said, be strengthened by the Lord, or be strengthened of the Lord. But he said, in the Lord. Only when our lives are positioned in the Lord, in union with him, in fellowship with him, in communion with him, then we are going to be strengthened by him and we will be able to overcome. We are going to be strengthened by him and we will have the victory over the enemy. Let us not fool ourselves and think that we can live any and any way. Let us not fool ourselves and think that we can live any and any way. And then, when it comes time to stand against the adversary, we just call and say, God, stand on me and my behalf. I rebuke you in Jesus' name and think that we are going to have the victory. Nothing like that. If you're thinking that way, you're making a sad mistake. If you are, are, if you are in Christ, how is it that people are supposed to be in Christ and addicted to the gambling trap? Should we really say that they are in Christ? Because if Christ comes and they have not repented, he will say, depart from me, I know you not. But the Bible says the wheat and the tears have to grow together. So let me, let me say, you are, you are in Christ. Or you should be in Christ. But, you, but you're hooked on gambling. You think that when it times come now for, for you to make a stand, you can just rest on the strength of Jesus and say, Jesus, you're making a sad mistake. So like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be practical as possible. So if you're a Christian and you, and, and you find yourself telling lies and troubling things that is not yours, if, if you can't break that spirit of adultery and that spirit of fornication and that spirit of malice and when it comes time for you to stand now, stand like a lion and defend yourself from the adversary and tell yourself you're going to rest upon the strength of Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Yes, I'm resting on your strength. You're not resting on the strength of Jesus. Because you're going to have to fix those first. So the apostle said that we're supposed to be strong in the Lord. It is when our lives are aligned to the things of God and to the will of God. And it's when our relationship is at that place with God. Then, oh glory, we can say, yes, God. I'm relying on the strength of Jesus Christ in this. How can we be addicted to porn? And think that we can just rest upon the strength of Jesus when it comes to, to standing. not going to work like that. It can't work like that. Just, just, cannot, just cannot work like that.
We can't live any and any way, brethren. And when it comes time to stand against the wiles of the adversary, we think that we can just rely on the strength of the Lord and be victorious. It doesn't work like that. You might rely on our strength, but it's your own strength, not the Lord's strength. The Bible says, the Bible says, some, you see, you see, if you, if you entertain the adversary, and if you continue to entertain the adversary, look here, I have seen it. I've been in church probably not as long as some folk, but I've seen many things in church. And the worst thing that you can see is somebody who, who will see the adversary, take them and mash them up. Sometimes you carry them back at the church door and say, look what I do. Samson was anointed. You see, when you, when, 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 when you think you can live any way you want to live, there is an anointing on you, you know, and, and that is what we're going to talk about. Knowing who you are, there is an, an anointing on you. And that anointing on you, look here. Samson was anointed. But then Samson did what they told him not to do. He went and got a wife from the enemy's camp. And they saw love is blind, you know, because this lady said, tell me your strength. And him said, bind me with some new ropes. And when he wake up, he was born in new ropes. It, something I should have said to him, said, look here. This lady really playing, you know. But because he was able to get up now and shake off. God not going to just depart from you just like that, you know. But Samson wouldn't leave. And when the lady tell me something again, Samson tell her when he wake up. It is not it. Samson give the lady his heart. Oh, glory. And that is, that is what the devil wants, you know. He wants you to give him your heart. And then he will take you. Because Samson finally healed to the pressure. And when he healed to the pressure, and when he wake up this time, he hear a cut. And when he start shaking, no one say, yes, the strength of the Lord. The strength of the Lord is not there. And I would to God that none of us right now is at the place where the strength of the Lord is gone. And we're trying to stand and we're just sleeping, we're just sleeping. We can't stand up. Trying to stand, but we're we, we waistline weak. We're not girded with truth. Glory. Anytime you entertain the enemy and start sleep with the enemy, when we say sleep with the enemy, you know, we're not talking about literally sleeping with the enemy. We're talking about doing the things that the enemy wants, entertaining the enemy. You will find out all of a sudden it will look like, but it's not all of a sudden. Because you know that God was slowly departing. And when you're ready to stand and say, yes, rely on the strength of the, of the Lord, because you know you have to face the enemy like Samson. No strength to face the enemy. Enemy took him. Tell you about the adversary, you know. His only plan is to destroy. Jesus said it. The thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. So they took him. They put out him eyes. So he can't see anymore. Can't see in the spirit. I would to God again that none of us is at the place where we can't see. 
in the spirit, you know. See where God is leading us. God is leading us. We can't see because our spiritual eyes are put out by the enemy. And then what the adversary does now? The, 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 the enslaved Samson. Samson was grinding the mill. What they used the horse or the cow to do. Samson was now doing that. Because they were making a mock of him. Mockery of him. So let us not fool ourselves thinking that we can live any and any way. We can do anything we want. And then when the adversary comes like a flood, yes, the Holy Ghost will lift up a standard. Holy Ghost will leave you for you to grab and, grab and straw. So if our lives is not at the place. And we are living in such a time like this. Look here, I'm talking to myself too, you know. I'm talking to myself. Because I want to make sure, I am here teaching, I want to make sure that my life is at the place. Right? Where we can stand up. Strengthened by the Lord when we need the Lord. Strengthen me, Lord. Strengthen me. Right? And help me to stand. So in last year, 19, he was blind. But the good thing is that is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he prayed, and God grant him strength. So let us turn to the book of St. John. Fifteen. St. John 15, verse 4. We were reading, reading a couple of the verses. So we are saying, I am saying to you, that the apostles say, be strengthened in the Lord. So we find the scripture. The Bible says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot be a fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do no. Hold on. Let me read this one again. He said, I am the vine, and he are the branches. The vine is, is basically the source, and the branches get the strength, the same strength that we're talking about, from the vine. Right? He said, he that abided in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, without Christ, he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words. You see how everything wrap up around the word? And my words abide in you. He shall ask what he will. And it shall be done unto you. It's important than saints of God. Important than saints of God. 
children of the most high God. It's important then for us to understand where our strength lies, where our strength comes from, where, where the source of our strength is. And the source of our strength is in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you can do nothing outside of me. So if we think that we can live, go to the online parties, because that is the latest thing now. And I say, yes, nobody can see me now on the online party. We're making a sad mistake. Because when the adversary comes, we are going to have problem because we cannot draw the strength of the Lord in order to fan off the adversary. The believer's empowerment comes from being in Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But in Christ, we have at our disposal his empowerment, uh, the strength of his might, through the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Lord's power makes us able and capable. He strengthens us with everything we need for any task. We can rely on the strength of the Lord and be victorious in this battle. When the apostle encouraged the believers to be strong in the Lord, he is calling them to faithfulness, faithfulness to abide in Christ and trusting in the Lord's power for everything that they have need of. The true Christian strength comes from recognizing our utter dependence on God. This is what Paul meant when he wrote, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And that is in Philippians 4, verse 13. So, so Paul, the apostle, recognized that all his strength comes from Jesus. And he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Being strong in the Lord, or to be strengthened in the Lord, also means that we are strongest in the Lord when we operate in the, in the realm of human weakness. In other words, his strength is perfect when our strength is gone. The songwriter says he will carry us when we can't carry on. God allowed Satan to afflict Paul. But God's purpose was to keep him humble and to demonstrate his power in his life. But Jesus said to me, and this was Paul relating his story now, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So Christ's power may rest on me. So when we operate in the realm of saying, yes, I am weak. It's not about me. It's all about him. I must decrease and he increase. When we operate in that realm, then we understand that we're not operating off our own strength, but we are operating off the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Often time, we fail to recognize that we are putting too much of our effort in this thing. And even when we say that, Lord, we leave this thing up to you, we still try to. And it's when we get a good hold of ourselves, we say, look here. We're still trying by our strength. But when we become weak, when we do everything that we, everything within our power and there is nothing more to do, and we say, God, I turn it over to you. I am frustrated now. God said, yes, give me it now. Ready feet. And then we see God work. And when God works this way, no man can say, look here, it is because of my own strength. 
but it is because of the strength of the Lord. So when the apostle encouraged the folks and said, look, you will be strong in the Lord, or be strengthened in the Lord, and in his mighty power, he's saying to them that when you operate, based off his experience, when you operate in the realm of weakness, then God's strength is perfect. And he said that I will continue to boast in my weakness so that God will even strengthen me even the more. Through the Bible, God delights in demonstrating his power in situation when human strength is lacking. And scripture for that is 1 Samuel 14. Um, 6, 1 Samuel 14, from 6 through to 15. And we are going to close with this one. And then next week we will pick up and we will you know, continue the lesson. And Jonathan said unto the young man that bear his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Listen to what Jonathan said. You know. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint of the Lord to save by few or to, to save by many. And his armor bearer. So this is two persons, you know. Jonathan and his armor bearer. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hands, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistine. And the Philistine said, Behold, these Hebrews come forth out of their holes where they hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto the armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord had delivered them into the hand. Of Israel. I want us to, 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 as we look at the scripture, we recognize how oh, many times Jonathan was saying that the Lord will deliver us. The Lord don't choose to save by a few or he don't choose to save by many. Anything he chooses to do, that, he, that is what he will do. But the point that I'm making that Jonathan rests upon the strength of the Lord. I don't know if Jonathan, I think that based on, I'm going to finish the story, I think that he was able to use his sword well. And the armor bearer that was with him was able to use their swords well. But he, in spite of all of that, he rests upon the strength of the Lord. And the men of the garrison answered and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said, The Bible, the, what the man them really said, Come up, you know, man. And we'll show you what I go. And really the man said, Come up, man, because I kill you, I'm going to kill you. Right. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord had delivered them into the hand 
of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up, upon his hand and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, slew after him. So, so what am, what am I must say? Jonathan does, just a kill him, you know, and his armor bearer falling behind him, make sure, say, look here, you kill him, me I make sure, say, you're dead. So, so in the battle, in first time battles, you know, the man might be wounded and on the ground, bawling, you know, and there is a clean up man behind, behind the army. So if you're bawling, look here, we're coming to clean you up. So that is what the armor bearer was doing. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, an half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled and the earth quake, so it was a very great trembling. All because one man decided that, look here, he is going to rest upon the strength of the Lord. This is what Jonathan said. If we go up, if them say, come up, the Lord give us them. And when he, when he, uncovered himself and they said, they said, come up, man. Jonathan said, yes. And one man clean up the 20 of them and the armor bearer follow behind him and, and, and just make sure they finish off everybody. Because one man decided that you know, he, he's going to rest upon the strength of the Lord. So you see, sometimes it is not about anything that we have. Some of the things that we want to do and the things that we want to move at. It's not about the thing that we have and how best we can, how we can plan it out. We have to just put aside some of the time, we just put aside everything. God give us wisdom, you know. But some of the time we have to just put aside everything and say, Lord, this one is yours, you know. And just allow the Lord to deal with it. So I am saying to us, it is important then to rest upon the strength of the Lord. As we go through this Christian journey, don't think that we are going to be able to dance with the adversary. And then when we discover that that is the adversary, we are going to be able to stand against the adversary. I tell you what the adversary is doing. While you are dancing with the adversary, and he's in disguise. He's studying you and studying everything about you. And when he unveils himself, there's nothing you can do. Because he don't know everything about you already. And know that you're not at the place. So I want to encourage us tonight. You know, that we are to be aware that we have an adversary. And that he's real. And his whole plan is really just to destroy our soul. The apostle, in telling, all, telling the Ephesians how to conduct themselves in spiritual warfare, said that we are to rest upon the strength of the Lord, are to be strengthened by the Lord, and the power of his might. So I tell you, as we continue this lesson, hopefully next week, all being well next week, uh, we will continue with this. There's a next thing that we want to look at, because even David, and David was called to, as a matter of fact, he wasn't even called to the battle, because all the men in Israel were trembling in their boots. David relied on the strength of the Lord. And Israel was victorious. But as we continue the lesson, we'll go through, the, we'll go through it. 
and then um, we will look at <coughs> how to identify you know ourselves and, and know who we are and whose we are and we're going to talk a little bit about the enemy and then we look really at the, the wild and like I said I want to just I want to be practical as practical as possible and some little things that that are dear and 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 we have questions, you know, and I just want to just take my time and, and just be as practical as possible so that when we are through, at least one person, you know, would, would get something and get it right so that at that day, you know, they can be reckoned with God. God bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let us bow our heads and pray. Father, we want to thank you once again and we thank you for your love we thank you for your mercies we thank you for what was said and uh, we pray lord jesus that you will continue to bless your people lord that you will have us to live the life god that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight lord jesus that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the adversary let us understand god that it's not about our strength but it's about your strength, Lord Jesus Christ, and that we are to rely on you, we are to rest on you, and to depend on you, Lord God, to fight our battles, because the battle is not ours, it's yours. Lord, we ask that you bless every heart, Jesus, that they will take these words that were meant, and God, and apply it to your life. God, the aim is for us to be better Christians, and for us to live the way that you want us to live. Hallelujah. We give you thanks tonight for hearing. We give you thanks tonight for answering. Thanks tonight for this vessel, Lord Jesus, that stood between you and your people. We ask, God, that you continue to work on this vessel, continue to use this vessel, Lord, to accomplish your will. We give you thanks right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I greet everyone again, streaming. It, whether it's Jamaica, whether it's USA, whether it's Canada, we greet you tonight again in Jesus' name. Amen.